Mr. Perkins. You must be Thomas Wolfe. I prefer to get my rejections in the mail, but I wanted to meet you. The man who first read Hemingway, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and said genius. Well, every son of a bitch publisher in New York hates my book. Mr. Wolfe, we intend to publish your book. <laughs> Max, this is Mrs. Bernstein. Mr. Perkins. She's the first person who told me my writing was worth anything. They're calling you a genius, Scott, help you. Now I'm a Scribner's bestseller. I deserve a little of the highlight. <laughs> Max tells us you're working on a new book. It's about America, all of it. <laughs> I have it, a new book. Bring it in, guys. Here you go. We can do it. How long? Nine months. If you resist the temptation to add more. I have to be able to add more. The book is 5,000 pages long. Point take. All right. Cut, cut, cut. You've been working every night for two years. Do you have any idea what it's like coming home to an empty apartment every night? I've lost him to your husband. Your daughters, they want their father back. It's my job. It's what I do. Two years and the book's only 100 pages short. I bring you stuff rich right from my gut. You wouldn't do this to Hemingway, to Fitzgerald. Stop it. You of all people just so damn scared to live. There are other ways to live. God help anyone who loves you, Tom, because for all your millions of beautiful words, you haven't the slightest idea of what it means to be alive. Max thinks he created me. He crippled me. He deformed my work. He made all your dreams come true. He gave you a career. Look what you have done to me. You hurt me. I can't turn my back on the work. Make your choice, Tom, right now. That's what we editors lose sleep over, you know? Are you really making books better or just making them different? In all my life, until I met you, I never had a friend. You have no idea what I had to go through so I can look at you and feel nothing. A writer like Tom, I get one in a lifetime. You get your daughters for the same lifetime. There's one paragraph I have to add to the book. By God, I have if to you add start adding paragraphs for son. This book is dedicated to Maxwell Everts Perkins. The author hopes this book will prove worthy of him. for great movies because they're few and far between and this is a really beautiful well-made movie congratulations guys on, on something like this it's no easy feat doing a period piece especially one off of a acclaimed amazing author Michael, I want to I want to ask you you know when you're when you're doing a movie like this and you're working with Thomas Wolfe's language how much are you crafting your images off of the sort of texture or the ideas in your head of what his language does for you when it describes people and places and Things. Uh, uh, Wolf's <laughs> writing was always there for us, and we obviously went to, I think it's fair to say a lot of us before we started the movie weren't familiar with it, and we immersed ourselves in it, and I think the texture of everything he did comes out in the way we photograph the movie, in the way we, in the way the performances, it's, it's all there, and I think we, uh, we, we enjoyed embracing it really, it's a hard read, I think. I think it's not an easy read, Wolf. It's, uh, it's, it's at times complex, and you have to really stick with it. But somewhere in there, I think um, there's something very rewarding at the end of it, and that's the way, uh, the way the narrative of this film goes as well. Jude, how did you approach playing uh, Thomas Wolf? It's obviously a very different character, but in many ways it felt like a bit of a spiritual cousin to Dickie Greenleaf at, at times. And his sort of... Dickie Greenleaf, kind of, a, kind of a prick, but a voracious appetite for life and jazz and, yeah. and flirting and playing and womanizing. That was sort of how I remember that character outside of his entitlements, but. Yes. Oh yes, no, now that you say that, you're absolutely right. I don't think, I, I'd never made that connection. Uh, maybe because of the, just the, 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 the amount of time it's been since I played Dickie Greenleaf. But uh, yeah, there are similarities. I, I started, uh, with Thomas Wolfe very much with a, a, a blank canvas. Um, I, hadn't, I hadn't read any of his work and didn't really know who he was. Um, and so started with the script, which was a wonderful script. And um, the script was based on a book um, uh, called Maxwell Perkins, uh, Editor of Genius. Uh, but John Logan had very much taken um, the, uh, this particular relationship and center, uh, put that at the center of his, of his story. So, fortunately for me, a lot of my work had been done. There was this great character on the page. Uh, through early, early, early discussions with Michael, it was clear that the, uh, 
suggestions on the page were uh, where he wanted to go with the character. So it was, the, the indications were obvious as to what I had to prepare. And then, as anyone should have, or, or anyone uh, uh, in my position should do, I think, I had to then go back and read his work, of which there is a lot, but also all of which is uh, biographical. And so it was a, a great source of um, information about his past, about his relationship with his family, how and who he was as a child, how he felt as an individual. And, um, and I then went on a little bit of a journey to Asheville and um, his hometown and uh, the surrounding area where he grew up and lived and was very much his spiritual home. Um, but to be honest, more than anything with this part, you know, and, and it's often the case, well, you, you approach each part differently, and so it's not like I have a structure of how one researches a role. With this, there was a lot to read, but in the end, it was, it's really down to the relationship I think you have with, your other, with the other actors and with your director, and it felt very much with Tom, Thomas that, that it was a case of leaping in, jumping into this, uh, this huge pool of... Um, uh, uh, desire and ebullience and um, uh, in, uh, 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 expression and um, lust for life. Uh, there's a moment in the movie uh, early on where Colin Firth's character Max is reading the manuscript or the early draft of, uh, excuse me, Look Homeward Angel, I believe, and his daughter says that's a, a pretty long paragraph and it's one page of a whole paragraph and he says, that started four pages ago. Yes. I would imagine a moment like that can also sort of give you an idea as to how to approach how this character talks, how this well, character yes, interacts exactly with life. exactly that. You can hear him if you read his work aloud. And once I, when I was trying to nail the accent, I started to read his work aloud. And what's extraordinary is, you know, he would often not take a breath. You can tell if it's, if it's flowing from him, as apparently it did, he would just stand and write and write and often write sometimes 10,000 words a night, hand write. Um, but if you read it aloud, you suddenly hear a man that just keeps talking and talking and talking, but then will suddenly go off on another thought like this over here, and you suddenly get a sense of what it was like to be in the room with this guy. And uh, Standing at the fridge writing, too. Is that a real thing that Tom Wolf was going to so, do? Yeah. There's a great photo of him uh, standing over a fridge in his apartment and Chelsea writing away. I just love that shot of him in his underwear, standing at the, at the fridge writing stuff, yeah. just totally lost in, in his own world. Uh, can you talk about uh, casting Colin Firth as, as Max, as the editor? Such a different dynamic, two different types of guys. You have one man who is voracious and, you know, quote unquote, loves life, and another man who loves life in a much more compartmentalized way, in a much more responsible way. I didn't cast him. The great joy was I inherited him. When the film finally came to me, uh, Colin Firth was already attached to it, so I couldn't have been uh, in a better position, really. And he was attached to it because he made a case to want to play it. He, was, he saw the screenplay very early on, I think, um, uh, in, the, in the latest manifestation of getting this movie together. It's been going for 14 years, this uh, trying to get this into, uh, turned into a movie. It's been, it's been with studios, it's been looked at for television. Other actors over 14 years have been attached and unattached. And I think Colin joined it in its most recent manifestation, and then that came to me. And then these guys came on board as a result of that, and that's how we got there. But it's it, he he kind it, it was it was now I know Colin and have worked with him. It was clear why he'd attached himself to it because I think he saw an opportunity in Max Perkins to bring something uh, of himself to that character that he knew he could deliver. I think he's got a real understanding of that man's um, um, internal life. Uh, and how to convey an internal life on screen, which I think is quite difficult. I mean, it's very interesting that it's the polar opposite of uh, Thomas Wolfe. And as you say, they're... they're the well, it's the lover of art. It's, it's the, the, the person who loves art but is never going to be acclaimed for being an artist in any way. It's always the sort of outside perspective. No. Can never actually live the artist's life because that's too many responsibilities, too many things to take care of in yeah. many ways. Yeah, that's right. And it's also an interesting... The role of the editor in the film it appealed to me anyway because it's, uh, it's not dissimilar to the role of a director in that you have, you have this great privilege to work with extraordinary talented people and part of your job is to hone and craft with them and collaborate with them and then bring them before a public. And that's pretty much, pretty much what Max Perkins has to do in this movie and uh, in his life with uh, all these great writers is to, is to work with them and bring them before the public with the huge dilemma that hangs over his head permanently, which is, am I actually making things worse or, or am I hopefully making things better? Uh, I imagine it to be the role of like a, a producer on movies a lot of times is the person who's sort of guiding the draft and then trying to guide the director and are they making it better or are they just interfering with, with visions? I'm, I'm sure sometimes they don't know. Laura, you play uh, Max Perkins' wife. 
And what I loved about your role is I think a lesser film, you would just be Max Perkins's wife. You would be there taking care of the kids and you would go away and that's it. But you were given great scenes, you were given great moments where we get to explore the role of a, of a woman within these sort of very heavy, heavily male-dominated relationships. Was that what drew you to, to the movie? No, well, what drew me to the movie was Michael. I mean, I was, you know, I've been an enormous fan of Michael's for a very long time, and quite frankly, he's sort of the greatest living theater director right. now. He just is. Um, so when he, it's, high it's true, <laughs> but it's it's just true. Um, so I was just thrilled to be invited, and also I will do anything I can to go work in London. It's my one of my favorite places to work. So I was, you know, thrilled to be just in such good company. And and John Logan, who wrote the script, and I went to college together. Oh wow! So it was also an opportunity for us to to um, for me to get to work with him again. But the the role is interesting. It's and and to see this, the quartet between uh, myself and Nicole Kidman, who plays. Um, Aline Bernstein, who is uh, Thomas Wolfe's partner, and Colin and I, the women, you have one woman who is an artist in her own right, uh, Aline Bernstein, who is Nicole, um, and she's able to pursue that life. But her, her personal life, her domestic life, is, is anemic and not, not present at all. And I'm the opposite. But I'm someone who wanted to have an artistic life, and because of the the time, you know, women of a, of a certain economic status to, to be an artist was very taboo, just not allowed. And Maxwell Perkins uh, instinctively kept his artistically, you know, loving wife outside of Manhattan in the suburbs to raise their five children. And she tried to be as uh, involved as she possibly could, but, but was not encouraged to do so. So you have one woman who, who has a, a domestic life that is that is unfulfilled, but an artistic life that is so, and the opposite with me, which is a, a home life which is robust and full of life and, and an artistic sensibility that is, that is really wanting. And there's a, the fantastic moment at the dinner table where you meet Jude Law's Tom Wolfe for the first time, and he sort of shuns your creative instincts or your artistic capabilities as a playwright. He says because he doesn't like theater, but I think it's mainly because you're a woman with, uh, with artistic impulses. And I was curious how you guys crafted that scene. Was that detailed in the script that you kind of give that look? Because that felt so much like, sure, I could see these lines on the page, but the look that you give is so perfect, like finding that in the rehearsal or finding that while you were shooting, how much that would sort of add punctuation to what that scene was trying to say. Well, when a scene is well written, it's sort of hard to do anything else <laughs> than, than what's there. I mean, when the when it's set, the context is set up so beautifully, it you sort of can't mm. go any other way with it. Um, and we did enjoy rehearsing it, um, getting yeah. it to a place where we at least when by the time we came to shoot it, it wasn't completely alien and new. It was something we had processed and. Obviously, something had to happen on the day that was different to the rehearsal, but the rehearsal was a wonderful moment to be able to discuss, to be able to explore, to be able to find out uh, anything that we could bring to it on the day. Um, and that's why I think there, things like a look and all of that kind of stuff can be thought about when actors have time to just sort of compute more than what's on the page. Good actors, then they'll come up with something with more than what's on the page, and that's, that's the joy of what you can do on the day. This is your uh, feature film uh, debut, right? After having done theater for so long, were you nervous going into it? What did you bring from the theater to, to film, or what did you try to sort of leave in the theater? And, and Terrified, not nervous, because it was, uh, it was entirely out of my comfort zone. And um, the only thing I've learned is it's quite good to be out of your comfort zone at my age. It's a nice thing. It's to explore new things and, uh, and, um, and be terrified. But uh, I did try to do as much research as I could before I actually went engage with it I've got a lot there's a lot there's quite a good history of uh, theatre makers who've become filmmakers and a lot of them are my friends and colleagues and so I spent days on sets in editing rooms in grades in all sorts of things and checking checking up the process but nothing can really prepare you for just being there and uh, and um, and being ready for it so I it, it was it was a glorious time for me because every single day was new Literally new. I had to, everything was. Everything had to be computed as if for the first time, and that's that sends every part of your body, makes it alive. 
you can't uh, tell at all. It's beautifully made. It's gorgeously shot and, and, and well cut. And what was your sort of instincts when you were working with your cinematographer there? How, how closely related to sort of your instincts when you're in the theater and you're setting up lighting in a, in a, in a not, big Not unlike the relationship you have with designers in the theater and lighting designers in the theater. <clears throat> it's a very collaborative process. Uh, I had an amazing cinematographer in Ben Davis who... Uh, I guess, looking back, could have been phenomenally patronizing if he wanted to, because he knew he was working with somebody who'd never looked through a lens before, but he actually was the reverse. He was, tell me what you want to do with the movie, tell me how you see this scene, tell me about your vision for this particular nat part of the narrative, and here's some ways we can do it, and we used a lot of research. The great joy of this period, generally, is that it's phenomenally well documented in stills photography. Uh, New York, 1928, 29, right the way through to 38, there's tons of stuff, material, and a lot of those stills pictures were huge influences, right down to the very first shot of the movie, which is feet walking on a wet sidewalk in, um, on Fifth Avenue. That was a stills photograph from that period that was quite inspiring to me, just in terms the, of... The opening you know, shot of the film? With yeah, the, yeah. I found, I found a stills photograph of a load of feet walking. They were, even in the, early, in the late 20s, the early 30s, people were already being very creative and artistic with stills photography. I think we think it was somehow the birth of photography, but it was quite advanced at that point. So lots of good stuff to draw on. Dude, were there recordings of Thomas Wolfe or anything that you went back to as well? I mean, there's a, you know, we have other actors in the film playing Hemingway, playing uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Zelda, uh, two authors at Hemingway and Fitzgerald, much more well documented, I think, probably than than Wolfe. Did you find other stuff other than just sort of the writing to be able no, to No, there's find no it? there's no recordings of Thomas Wolfe, um, but there are um, several recordings of his brother, who uh, he apparently sounded very, very like. Um, and his mother, um, who strangely went on a, a, a game show, sort of 20 years later, who, uh, to, and it was, um, it was a sort of guess, guess who my famous son was uh, kind of <laughs> game show. Um, but I learned a lot, I learned a lot from listening to the brother, and, um, and as I said earlier, from actually uh, reciting the, uh, um, the books aloud. You just start realizing that this is probably a person who just moves really fast and everything is quick. Yeah, it, it wasn't so much about speed. To me, there was more about a sense of uh, agitation and um, uh, uh, um, not awkwardness even. I, I kept picturing that he was like, um, like lightning in a bottle and that he, that he just, he, he, everything was an idea and everything wanted everything registered and wanted to kind of come out of, an, of a part of his body. So there was a sort of fidgeting, um, anxious, animated, and yet constantly trying to contain himself and be present. Because, of course, his writing was all about being in the moment and expressing truth from the moment. And yet he was very much someone who was, um, I felt, also moving through the moment. So it was this push-me-pull-you existence that I, I tried to emulate physically. A person that you would want to hang out with in reality, or not? I think I'd like to meet him for an evening. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then maybe that would be enough. Because he'd probably steal my wallet, leave me hungover, <laughs> and abandon somewhere on the side of a freeway. You'd have a very memorable evening, but you wouldn't necessarily want to see him again. And you've, you've uh, worked with the screenwriter before, or at least said his words before. He wrote uh, The Aviator, yes. which I actually happened to rewatch a few weeks ago. It's just one of the most beautiful films of the last 20 years. It's incredibly yes. well made. Mind you, if, if you blink, you miss my part in it. But no, your part, your, your part is amazing. You have that great line where they throw something at your head and That's you right. turn around and you say something like, was that meant for me? That's right. And you start a fight. And, uh, <laughs> who, who is the actor again that you play in it? The famous I'm actor? I'm playing Errol Flynn. Errol Flynn. That's yeah. right. That's his name. Uh, did you, did you, that chap. <laughs> that guy. That guy. That I know guy. that you got hit by something, but not the star's <laughs> name. Uh, did you know John Logan coming off of The Aviator, or is this no. just sort of happenstance that you're... It was just, it, that was just a, a coincidence, yeah. No and playing another real-life person yes, as well. Yes, yes, indeed. How did you and Colin Firth uh, work together? Did you guys talk, ab how did you talk about the characters and figure out their relationship? Well, we were fortunate that... Um, Michael uh, had a scheduled and, and, and wanted to um, have a proper rehearsal period, which is um, not always the case. You know, um, some directors wouldn't know what to do with a rehearsal period. Some um, positively uh, run away from rehearsals, and others hold rehearsals and, and don't, you know, don't use them correctly. My, Michael uh, went in, and we knew that we were going to have a really healthy uh, opportunity to sit down and discuss the um, the relationships, to actually put the piece on its feet, and really arrive on set, therefore prepared and 
kind of ready to film, really. Um, Colin and I, surprisingly, really had barely met. I don't think we'd even, well, I think we'd maybe said hello once or twice at a, at a sort of uh, uh, event uh, or two, but we'd never really sat down and met. And um, we fortunately struck up a great friendship and a great sense of trust and a bond very, very quickly. And the piece and the relationship offered, you know, uh, huge uh, uh, areas to discuss. So an awful lot initially was us really just talking about the relationships and talking at length about the essence of, of where and what we wanted to achieve um, in all these uh, uh, available layers of the relationship. Um, it was also, am I right in saying, well, certainly I was aware, because we've talked a lot about the, 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 um, the uh, ebullience of, 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 of Wolf, um, you know, Perkins at the same time was also very uh, conservative and contained. And for me, it was really a case of m offering up what I could of, of Wolf's energy and for you to find or conduct a sort of rhythm, um, a balance of the two of us. Because I, I kept thinking, am I going too far or is Colin not doing enough? Where, where, do, we, where do we find it that It was balance? about trying to trust the balance between the two very extreme personalities. Mm. But actually celebrating two extreme personalities and not trying to somehow join them up and bring them, keeping the polar opposites. I mean, there's a line in the film about the nature of genius and one of the things that Max has is a genius for friendship, it's, uh, uh, the line is. And I think that's an important uh, quality. Interestingly, I think both of these actors, Jude and Colin, have that, uh, which is one of the reasons when they met, <coughs> there was they mm. hit it off. They hit it off, and they 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 brought a friendship out of out of them getting to know each other very very quickly. I guess partly at the back of your heads, you knew that would be helpful, and therefore it was mm. worth forging. But it happened very naturally as well, and it was something that has made huge difference to the way this film worked out because these guys just in the two week rehearsal period kind of bonded in a meaningful way that meant when we when we came to shoot there was something of substance already there and um, that was hugely helpful for a director. Now a two week rehearsal period I think as you've already said is very rare these days when it comes to filmmaking but you said a lot of directors would run from that why would a it seems to me like you would have this period of time where you can figure out how your performance is going to do it. But also it. save time and money yeah. I mean because otherwise you turn up on set and you've got to start from page one like what are we going to do you think well we can arrive prepared if you wish. I genuinely think and this isn't judgment because I'm happy to work either way. I think maybe my experience in theatre le lends me personally to a, 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 a position where I prefer to rehearse. But I think genuinely um, a lot of film directors just don't necessarily know what to do with it. They, they wouldn't necessarily know what to do. And they expect actors to arrive on set ready to go and um, don't see that there's any benefit in, in playing with it. I think they worry that perhaps recreating something or that we wouldn't be able to recreate something. They, they don't, there are so many directors who, you know, are fantastic technically and are wonderful with production, yeah. but they don't really understand what actors do and why we do it and how we do it. So there's, there's, I've been on certain sets where they like, save it, save it, don't, <laughs> don't. And, you know, as when you'll you, never as is you'll again. never be able to do it again. Yeah. That it's this sort of ephemeral, mysterious sort of thing. And for some actors, maybe it is that way. Maybe there's cause for, for that type of fear. But there, is, um, there are certain directors who just, who, who just sort of don't quite understand the resources they have. But isn't the idea of like you, you rehearse, it doesn't matter how fantastic your writing is, when your actors start performing it, things start to change and move, and the scene moves slower, it moves faster, and you can insert or take away. And you can start thinking about how you're going to edit that and how you could shoot it better. Why wouldn't you want that as a, as a filmmaker? Why would you think that the most professional actors that you could possibly have on set can't do it more than once? Well, they're, they're actors, directors, and then they're directors who, who actors are, are there, but it's not the, the most interesting thing to them. It just isn't. That blows my mind. Actors but, are amazing. But, it, but I think that's true. Yeah, it's very you true. You know, it's absolutely yeah. true. There's certain people who are purely you know, cinematic, who are absolutely about the image and about the production and what they can do with an image and how far they can go with action and with um, lenses and mm. cranes. And, and that can be really fun to do a film like that. It can be, but they're not um, the depth of character or the, um, the quiet equally, moments are not. You, you mentioned this before. I think equally, not to put it all in the, in the, in, in the director's, um, um, or, or at the director's feet, I think equally there are actors, as you, as you hinted. There are also actors who turn up and do their thing, as it were, yeah. brilliantly, 
Um, but they're not interested in mm -mm. rummaging around looking for something else either. They want to turn up on the day, they'll give you what they know works, yeah. and then they want to go home. There's, there's some actors who rehearsal for them. I remember it took me a very long time mm. to realize that rehearsal had a different definition in film mm. than it did in theater. That it, for a long time, it was basically just a time for the other actors to get together to sit at a table and say how they wanted the language changed. <laughs> they would read a scene and then they would say how they wanted it different. They wanted to say it this way, they wanted to say it that way, and there was nothing about mm. anything other than, than that. But those have to be very specific kind of productions because I feel like the two of you have also worked with some of the incredible writer-directors that, that, that we have. Last time you were here, I just praised you for your work and you can count on me because I think Kenneth Lonergan is like the great genius. You've worked with Wes Anderson as well. It has to work differently, I would assume, with them. They're much more protective of the... And, and also, I mean, he's a theater director as well, so I'm assuming he crafts with the actors a little bit. Oh, sure. Yeah, there are all sorts of different types yeah. of... of categories of, of directors. Writer directors come with their own sort of um, characteristics as do directors from the theater who, who sort of understand the best what everybody has to offer. I remember um, they, they seem to me, at least theater directors seem to me, to be the, the less, less fearful of the lot yeah, that's true. because they know what a designer does. They know and how they can help them. They know what actors do, good actors, and how they will come in service to the film or to the director. So it's, it's um, is that fair, Jude, do you think? Very, very fair, yeah. You know? uh, let's turn it over to the audience for questions. <laughs> Who has a question? Hey guys, uh, so with this movie being about literary figures, do you guys have like a favorite author that you uh, enjoy reading or inspires you? Uh, Steinbeck, and I love A.S. Byatt. I like um, I like Iris Murdoch. Mm. See, we're all going to name well, we're going to name some Brit Brits, I suppose. I, 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 Edna O'Brien is interesting because I think the latest book she's come out with is one of her best. I think, yeah. It was, but um, I have to say that, of course, this film made us all immerse ourselves in this period of literature and all of the... Because uh, Perkins, while the film is mainly about his relationship with Wolfe and a little bit of Hemingway and a little bit of uh, Fitzgerald, it's all those great authors of that period of the century. And I think when you're coming to a movie like this, uh, in doing your research, you kind of either revisit some of them if you've read them before or come to them new, like Wolfe. And that's kind of blown my head off because there's such extraordinary talent out there that I didn't even know about. Am I wrong or exaggerating when I think that the, that period of literature is considered widely like the golden age of the American age. literature? Yeah. Mm. So that's where literature is, 70s is movies, and mm. 10 years ago is TV. Uh, next one. Hi, guys. Thanks for being here. Great to see you guys. Um, I was wondering, from directing and acting, did you learn anything about yourselves while filming that you'll bring to your next movie or any kind of role? I think um, I, I think I think there was I, I left this experience. Cur I'm always curious to find out um, or to mine not the opposite, not exactly the opposite in in uh, retaliation to the part I've just played, but if anything, just through my I, I guess it says something about me. But it is it is I, I'm often curious at the end of a role to try and find something that the character didn't have. And I suppose I, I left Thomas Wolfe wanting to find a part next that was uh, a, a sort of a peace and, and, and had a sort of stillness to them. So I guess if I, if I left with something, it was a sense of this sort of energy and this um, restlessness that I ultimately wanted to shed. <laughs> uh, for me, it just sort of confirmed what I've always suspected, which is, you know, the better the people, the better time you're going to have you know so for me it was just you know loving being with this this whole group and it just you know no matter what size your role is just how incredibly fulfilling that experience can be from a new filmmaker's perspective a lot of people had said to me before i did it get just get make sure you've always got as much as you can get as much coverage as much going and i thought i did and uh, and we and we got and we got the movie we wanted to make. But next time, I think I'll try and get maybe a bit more as well. <laughs> Did you find that when you were shooting on the day? Were you taking that advice seriously and trying to get everything that you possibly could? And, and as soon as I saw 
what I wanted to, what I was hoping for and felt that we'd got it, I felt that should probably be the moment to move on, but actually, frequently, I now realize I should just probably carry on a little bit longer, if not a lot longer. I don't want to go on a lot longer. But a lot of the actors, you know, when we got what we were after, would frequently say, should we just do something now, maybe that you might find useful in the edit and just do something completely off, off the radar because we've got time? And that frequently ended up something that would, one would go to in the edit that wasn't really part of any timetable at all. Absolutely, next question. There you go. Uh, I was wondering uh, if you have, you guys have any other uh, actors or directors that you haven't had a chance to work with that you would still like to work with? Well, from a director's point of view, there's always a whole heap of actors out there that one wants to work with. I'm not going to name names partly because I'm put on the spot right now. I can't think of any, but there's a ton. And the, I just, I love, I, I started as an actor and I love actors because I find them just the the most creative people on earth and the most wonderful people on earth and I just want to try and, you know, make as much work with them as possible. So the answer to your question from my perspective is yes, there's a lot out there. Both yeah, of you have it's, worked it's with... It's such an interesting... Directors. You know, there are, the, the experience of working with, with directors that you've already had the opportunity to work with, again, to me is always very interesting because um, you've, you've already established a, a, a set of... Um, um, short yeah trust and, and and shortcuts that you know next time will just leave you in a situation to start already further down the line so there's that there's i mean but there are certainly directors out there gosh uh, i think paul thomas anderson is a, a brilliant filmmaker i've always loved the coen brothers there's a whole heap of young directors coming up at the moment who i think are very exciting uh robert eggers is, is I, I loved his first film the witch um there are, there are lots lots of isabel croisette i like very much um Lots. What he said. <laughs> <laughs> Lots. Uh, guys, when does the film come out? When can people see the movie? June 10th, this week. June 10th, this week. Guys, thank you so much for being thank here. You. Congratulations. Thank you. Great work. Thank you. Thank you.